The idea of panspermia, or the concept that microbial life can be distributed throughout the cosmos, riding on dust or in meteorites, comets, and so on, is actually a very old idea. The concept, perhaps surprisingly, goes back to the 5th century BC Greek philosopher Anaxagoras. Though only vaguely did he mention it, as most of the aspects involved with panspermia were unknown in his time. But it was revived and considered somewhat widely in the 19th century, before the basic hypothesis we have today was formed in 1903 by chemist Svanta Arrhenius. The idea that microbial life can be deposited on other worlds to form colonies is intriguing, because it allows for the exchange of microbial life from bodies within the same star system. This leads to some interesting possible scenarios, such as that life originated in our solar system on Mars in the days when it was habitable, in fact more so than early Earth at the time was, and then was deposited on Earth to colonize after an asteroid impact on the parent world. Or the same could be hypothesized in the opposite direction, where life originated on Earth only to be deposited on Mars or perhaps Venus in the same way. Europa and Enceladus also come into play here. So the bottom line is that planets within a star system can exchange materials, and if life happens to catch a ride in a meteorite and have the luck to land on a planet where it can get a foothold, then life can transfer and spread throughout its own star system. This is of particular importance in situations like the TRAPPIST-1 system, where you have seven planets, all in an orbital resonance, that carries them very close to their neighbors, opening the way for easy, fast, and straightforward panspermia, at least as a possibility on those worlds, in the system capable of sustaining it. The problem with panspermia, however, is that it's not currently very easy to prove. We'd need to find extant life on Mars and compare its genome to that of Earth to try to work out if it's truly alien or otherwise just a cousin, or for that matter, a parent. This is less of a problem for the so-called pseudopanspermia, or sometimes soft panspermia, where abiotic non-living chemical building blocks of life are transferred. This one is known to happen outright. Amino acids have been found in meteorites, and most recently in samples returned from the asteroid Ryugu by Japan's Hayabusa 2 mission. It's beyond likely that some of the chemicals on the surface of the Earth that led to abiogenesis originated from space, in fact, very likely, the outer solar system. Recently, even sugars have been found in two separate meteorites, one found in Northwest Africa, and the other is a rather odd tale indeed. It's a very primitive carbonaceous chondrite that fell near Murchison, Victoria, Australia in 1969. This meteorite was seen to fall at about 11 in the morning, in conjunction with people hearing a huge detonation 30 seconds later. The meteorite blew to pieces, and as a result, fragments were collected almost immediately afterward preserving the pristine chemical makeup of the meteorite. One even went through the roof of a barn. Also of interest, Murchison contains within it silicon carbide particles that are the oldest known material on Earth. In fact, these are quite a bit older than the solar system, coming in at about 7 billion years old. That's right, there is interstellar material on this planet that predates the formation of the solar system that has already been discovered. But that's not all. This meteorite shows alterations, while it was on its parent body that are consistent with the action of liquid water. Also more than 15 amino acids were found in this meteorite. Some are normal amino acids that we see incorporated in life on Earth, though you don't need life to produce amino acids. But it also had unusual ones that aren't typically seen on Earth. Does this offer a different pathway to life? We don't know. But it's clear that pseudopanspermia through asteroid and meteorite impacts early in Earth's history may have been responsible for the genesis of life on this world. But there's a problem. What if panspermia itself delivered life to an already inhabited Earth? There are two ways to look at this. The first is that life that's established and adapted to an environment could automatically be resilient. Think of it like this. Microbial life adapted to a specific tidal pool on Earth encounters panspermic microbial life from Mars, a different planet. It's reasonable to suspect that the existent Earth life will be advantaged and wipe out the panspermic colonizers, but that may not be the case. It may be that the colonizers are more broadly suited for making colonies and thusly eradicate the first genesis of life on a planet. 
This could lead to a situation of a panspermic terminator, life so unbelievably well suited for traversing space inside rocks that can cause the extinction of any indigenous life it might encounter on an exoplanet. Think of it being favored by virtue of simply being tougher. Super life, if you will. It gets worse in situations of frequent panspermia, where there is a regular and constant exchange between similar worlds, as might be the case with Travis 1. The dominant, most broadly adapted life will be the winner in such a system. This is very tricky because we could see this in our solar system. If we find Earth life genetically related to our brand of life on Mars, Venus, or the ice shell moons, it would mean that panspermia of some kind happened. But it wouldn't rule out the possibility of indigenous abiogenesis. It could be that there was no life on those worlds, or this one before panspermia. Or it might be that there was life and it was eradicated by some superior microbe that could have originated in any number of bodies in the solar system, leaving no trace of the original life. This is one area of astrobiology that actually scares me because of the questions it opens up. For example, the leap from prokaryotic life to eukaryotic life. That's always been seen as a possible great filter because it took Earth a very long time, over a billion years, for that leap to happen to allow for multicellular life to begin. Recent evidence suggests that it may not have been that hard of a process. It was thought that it required one organism to absorb another without digesting it. But recent work showed that symbiotic relationships between organisms might have provided a path for that, in which case it's not a great filter. It's just waiting around for it to happen if symbiosis between organisms is common in the universe. It certainly is here. But a question can be asked. In a situation where you have competing microbes, one of an indigenous origin and one of an alien origin, can this process occur? Maybe the solution to the Fermi Paradox is simply that Earth life got lucky and had enough alone time to become resilient. But in systems like TRAPPIST-1, the panspermic exchange is so great that everything remains microbial, because there's just too much disruption to allow for anything further than simple life. If you will, a war of evolution by panspermia. I can't think of a spookier term than weaponized evolution, but it can happen in other ways. You could, in principle, enter a star system with a planet conducive for life, and then alter that life to be whatever you want. If you foresee that it may evolve into an intelligent species at some point, you could tailor it to be whatever you wish, so long as the ends meet your objectives. You never have enemies if you're the first in line and can dictate the development of all civilizations. You could then term this macropanspermia where it's not microbial life transferring and altering things, but macrofauna. Of course, there's no real evidence that this has ever happened here. Our genome looks absolutely natural in all aspects. But there may be situations out there somewhere in the universe where aliens may look at their genetics and see very obvious signs of alteration that could ultimately define their entire society. If you see your genetics have been obviously manipulated, then what questions do you ask? What conclusions do you come to? One can easily envision things like religions being founded on such a finding, or even a kind of bitterness towards the species that altered the natural genetics of the other species. This has been explored in science fiction, an example being the Krogan of the Mass Effect trilogy, my own personal all-time favorite game. But in the case of microbial panspermia, we tend to think of it as a benign colonization of an uninhabited world. But the reality of the microbial realm here on Earth is survival of the fittest. And it may not be the case that the most fit is the life indigenous to a world undergoing a transfer of life from another world. But you have to wonder where this ends. In science fiction, the usual depiction of the transfer of a pathogen is something virus-like or a pathogen that's neither a microbe nor a virus, such as that depicted in Michael Christian's book Andromeda Strain. But there's also the option of the microbes where a very widely adapted microbe that can attack just about anything gets transferred. The idea of pathogens transferring by panspermia is spooky, but it has to be said that there are problems. The first is with astrovirology. The thinking there is that viruses are a natural counterpart to cells, and as happened here, almost always occur alongside life itself. There's some thinking that it may even be required. But viruses are very specific things, and it doesn't seem likely that an alien virus could infect anything on Earth. 
There's been some question of generalized viruses originating on dying worlds that adapt to infect anything they possibly can, but that's a stretch. And it has to be said, Earth does not appear to have any alien viruses, nor do we see any mass extinctions in natural history that could be attributed to such a thing. It hasn't happened yet, so it probably doesn't happen. With microbial life, however, the palette is more broad. But in the Andromeda strain scenario, where it's something new, neither virus nor microbe, but an envisioned extraterrestrial pathogen for which there is no analog on Earth, we can only guess if that's possible. But I leave you with one final thought. Technology can mimic nature, and that leaves the option of one further type of pathogen that may lurk in the universe at large and await any would-be human colonizers of other worlds, technological pathogens. Could molecular nanotechnology be created that infects and alters or destroys organisms? Perhaps some out-of-control ancient weapon whose creators are long wiped out, but the technology persists on a formerly inhabited exoplanet. In principle, this is possible and may represent one of the greatest threats to galactic colonization a species will ever face. Perhaps that in itself is the solution of the Fermi Paradox, in that civilizations never leave home due to the inherent danger of artificial pathogens, and it's simply best to stay on your home world and protect it as best you possibly can from this type of technology, and that we as a civilization so far have simply gotten incredibly lucky. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently somewhat surprised by the DART mission. It actually moved to the target asteroid by a factor of three more than what was predicted. At least in this case, moving an asteroid is easier than we thought, opening the way for an age of planetary protection from asteroids. Being the only remaining dinosaurs, the jealousy of the birds is so thick you could cut it with a beak, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.